This video is brought to you by and recorded on the brand new SteelSeries Alias Pro, an all-in-one recording and streaming microphone that not only produces studio quality sound, but also comes with an advanced software suite allowing you studio level control over your sound and setup. The Alias Pro released just last night and you can get 12% off it when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. When it comes to Assassin's Creed Mirage, context matters, and the context for this game is twofold. Number one, Mirage is a throwback to the classic Assassin's Creed formula that Ubisoft moved on from in the recent trilogy of Origins, Odyssey, and Valhalla. Those games were essentially open world RPGs with numerous landmark cities to explore, hundreds of pieces of loot to collect, and a focus on action over stealth. In contrast, Mirage is the opposite of all those things. This is one location, Baghdad, there's very little loot to collect, and the focus is absolutely on stealth and assassinations. It harkens back to Assassin's Creed 1 through 3, I'd say, as things got a lot bigger and more sprawling with Black Flag. This throwback to this old formula is not just for shits and giggles, mind you, it's very much a response to the frustrations people have with that new trilogy, which to be clear, is a very successful trilogy, and it's absolutely the future of the Assassin's Creed franchise, whether you like it or not. Those games are really massive for Ubisoft and they're going to continue to invest big in them going forward. But those games, Valhalla in particular, are held up as some of the worst examples of video game bloat, prioritizing quantity over quality in every aspect. That commentary has definitely set in around that trilogy, and it's very clear that Mirage exists as a response to that, since this one clocks in at a very lean 15 hours to clear, probably around 25 hours to get the Platinum Trophy. So that's one context, the throwback to the old formula and a response to the criticism. The other context is that Assassin's Creed Mirage started out its life as a DLC for Valhalla. The team were working with Basim, the assassin character who finds Ivar at the beginning of his journey, and they wanted to do an origin story for Basim because he's kind of a big deal in Assassin's Creed lore. They say that this eventually led them to a bigger, more ambitious story that necessitated its own game. But let's not forget that making it a standalone game also helps Ubisoft's release cadence, since this is now a boxed product that serves as a stopgap while we wait for the next major Assassin's Creed game, which is rumored to be releasing sometime next year, but that's by no means a sure thing. This converted DLC thing really goes a long way to explain why Assassin's Creed Mirage is a pretty threadbare offering. I'm not talking threadbare in terms of number of hours, by the way, since I'm 100% totally fine with a 15 hour Assassin's Creed game. I welcome it, in fact. When I say threadbare, I'm really talking about the amount of innovation and imagination that's gone into this thing. Mirage feels very by the numbers, hearkening back to that old formula without iterating on that core gameplay nearly enough. Baghdad is actually a really nice space to explore and move around in, but almost no effort was made to differentiate its districts, and the space outside the city is totally wasted. Narratively, it's so thrown together, and it's easily the worst written Assassin's Creed game I've played, with a total absence of memorable characters, iconic villains, hell, even a plot. This game genuinely struggles to set up a basic plot you might follow, as its investigations continue to reveal and then resolve themselves at a pace so rapid you'll fail to notice when one starts and another ends. To be honest, Mirage is kind of frustrating, because I think that what this game proves is that the core gameplay loop of parkour and stealth really holds up. It definitely does. I enjoyed the act of playing this game infinitely more than I did the sloppy action combat of the recent trilogy. I loved being an assassin again, and I really loved the opening hours of this game. I was like, Assassin's Creed is back, baby, let's go. But as the hours wore on without that gameplay, city, or narrative evolving in any way, it dawned on me that Mirage is what we all kind of feared it might be. It's the old formula shuffled out the door for one more go around with very little effort made to evolve what that formula is or how it might be used. This is by no means terrible and I think that at certain price points this is going to hit right for plenty of people but I also think that this could have been a lot more than it ended up being. I hope it isn't erected as a straw man like well Ubisoft tried to bring back the old formula and it didn't work because I think this formula has a hell of a lot more value than what Mirage was able to showcase. You have died. Assassin's Creed Mirage is an origin story for one of the franchise's most important characters, Basim. When we meet him, Basim is a humble street thief with starry eyes and big dreams. While trying to scratch out an existence on the streets of Baghdad, he also waxes lyrical about the plight of the common man living under the soft felted heel of the corrupt caliphate and its various adjuncts. 
Basim believes that it is his duty to fight this injustice, and in his view, his best shot at doing that is alongside the Hidden Ones, aka the Assassins. This is where the Assassins enter the mix. Rashan, played by the incomparable Shor Agdashlu, reluctantly takes Basim as an apprentice, training him at Alamud, which is essentially the high temple of the Assassins and a central location in Assassin's Creed lore. One thing leads to another, and eventually Basim finds himself back in Baghdad, ready to find and assassinate members of the Order, the malevolent shadow organization that is the primary antagonist of the Assassin's Creed franchise. So this setup is actually pretty great, to be honest. One of the criticisms of the recent trilogy is that it doesn't focus enough on all the assassin stuff. And here you've got this game that is just straight up assassin stuff with the proper robes and Alamut and the wrist blades and all that cool shit. It was also quite character driven in this opening act. You will meet friends, mentors, villains, and these characters are being fleshed out as actual people. I was totally down with all of this. And in those opening hours, I was like, hell yeah, man, this is going to be a good ride. It's when you get back to Baghdad that things really start to go off the rails massively. Mirage is the quintessential Ubisoft game, one where the structure dictates everything else. Remember, Ubisoft open world games are almost always non-linear. They give you a map and allow you to explore that as you please, and each region will have a story arc that can be completed in any order. Far Cry does this, The Division does this, the recent Assassin's Creed trilogy did this. On the one hand, it's cool because freedom, right? Go where you like, accomplish goals in whatever order you like, what's not to love? Well, the problem is that because you're able to complete these story blocks in any order, they all need to be self-contained storylines that are not dependent on the other storylines. This means that instead of there being one story told sequentially, it's an anthology of stories that combine to create a broader narrative. This structure will automatically result in weaker narratives almost every time, because instead of characters or plot lines being built up sequentially, you sort of have to Voltron a plot together by combining these separate stories. That's what's going on here in Mirage, but it's actually worse because the same storytelling structure is applied again, but now at one or two levels below that regional level. I know that doesn't make sense, so let me spell it out for you. Mirage has five major targets that you are hunting. You don't know who they are, and you need to conduct an investigation to find out their identity. Each investigation is led out of a Hidden One's office in Baghdad, so you visit that office and that kicks off that region storyline, culminating in the assassination of one of these Order members. The thing is, to find out who that Order member is, you have to conduct a number of smaller investigations, which are themselves contained, non-sequential storylines that can be completed in any order. It's classic Ubisoft, where narrative integrity is sacrificed at the altar of game structure. It's basically impossible to follow all of these small storylines because they get spun up and resolved so quickly. You find a document somewhere and you're like, well, this proves that this person's bad, better go kill them. And you've never laid eyes on this person before. You've got no idea what their deal is, but some scrap of paper says that they're bad, so now you gotta go kill them. And then you do that, and that gives you another clue, which just daisy chains on and on towards the final big bad of the region. This absolutely does not work in any way, shape or form. Not only does it make events difficult to follow, but it makes it impossible to develop characters properly. You'll meet one companion in one region, spend a total of about 15 minutes with them and cutscenes spread out across different investigations, and then never see them again. It also fails to establish proper villains. Like, I get the conceit of it being a mystery and needing to uncover the identity of these people, but when every single target is completely unknown to you five minutes before it's time to kill them, it becomes impossible to establish them as actual people, actual villains who you might feel something about rather than just straight up target dummies. All of this is exacerbated by how disappointing Basim is as a main character. He has basically no arc. I mean, he kind of does. They do this weird thing where he's haunted by his dreams or whatever. But outside of that, four fifths of this game, he is just a stone cold killer until the very end of the game where it makes a hard left turn and starts dealing with all the assassin stuff again. It's like 80% of this game's narrative is delivered in the last 90 minutes, for real. There's an interesting story bubbling under the surface that is completely parked for the majority of this game's runtime, only for it to be hastily and confused confusingly dumped out at the end. Unfortunately, this structure and this writing has a terminal impact on Mirage, and I'll tell you why. The gameplay, setting, and scenarios offered throughout the 15 hour runtime don't change very much. They are basically the same from start to finish. You will quickly master the core gameplay, making stealth and combat very rote affairs. The various set pieces don't change things up much. And once you've seen one part of Baghdad, you've seen it all. Now, if this game had a banging script with incredible characters, plot twists, lore dumps, all that shit, then the game would have held together because what's on offer on the gameplay and world design front 
is just enough to keep you engaged as you work towards the next rewarding cutscene. If this game delivered on the narrative front, I would absolutely be recommending it to you right now, no question. But with such repetition baked into not only its gameplay and its world design, but also its narrative, it just doesn't work. And I think Mirage struggles to justify even its very lean 15 hour runtime. So that was a pretty damning assessment of the narrative and structure, but I want to be clear that I like many of the other components of this game a lot more. And one of my favorite things is actually Baghdad. 9th century Baghdad is a cultural center, a place where art, science, and technology are thriving. It's here you'll find grand libraries, bustling bazaars, academies of learning, poetry readings, and all manner of mercantile trade being conducted in busy streets. I've never played a game set in Baghdad or anything like it really, and I quite enjoyed how committed Ubisoft were to highlighting the different aspects of this place and society. You'll find codex entries which you can pick up near major landmarks, and each of them shed light on a place and time that I didn't know much about and now I know a little more. Ubisoft have long used the Assassin's Creed games as a platform for virtual historical tourism, and it's the same here. I do actually recommend taking the time to read through these codex entries, as they will make you appreciate the buildings you're climbing over and fighting in a lot more. Aesthetically, Baghdad looks really nice. One of the things I really appreciate about Mirage is its restraint. I'm sure the artist could have spun up a version of Baghdad that is bigger, grander, full of colossi-sized megalomania. But they didn't. Baghdad is instead a bunch of intricately designed streets and public spaces punctuated with the occasional major landmark that, while impressive, doesn't look out of place. I suspect Ubisoft were confident that the city they built here was beautiful enough to stand on its own two feet, and as such, Baghdad feels a lot more, dare I say, realistic and immersive than a lot of the other Assassin's Creed locations I've been in. Technically, I will fly that there was one very big issue that I encountered on PC. Your mileage may vary, but playing on a top-end PC, I was regularly getting these massive freezes where the entire game would seize up for like three to five or more seconds. It typically happened during very intense action sequences, which really interrupted the flow of events. It was some Sometimes a little bit annoying and other times utterly infuriating. There was a patch deployed during the review period which did not fix this. I wouldn't classify it as game ruining, but it was definitely very disruptive. And if you're playing on PC, you either have to be ready for this and accept it, or you have to hold off until patch notes make clear that this issue has been corrected. Outside of that, technical performance is actually very solid in the sense that I only encountered some very minor bugs where enemies or NPCs would jank out on geometry a little. I had no crashes, no bugged quests. All up, that seizing issue aside, it seems to be a solid PC port, so let's hope that issue gets fixed up soon. Coming back to Baghdad, it's a smaller space than how much geography was afforded us in the recent trilogy, but Baghdad still feels big enough. Scale is not the issue here though, instead the problem is diversity. One of the challenges of having a single location is it's a single location, it's already going to have trouble providing the sort of visual diversity that the entire Mediterranean could. Still, Ubisoft knew these constraints going in, and yet they made no effort to make different parts of the city feel distinct. There aren't unique enemy types that only appear in one part of the city or another. There aren't gangs or factions in specific locations you might brush up against. There aren't certain types of side activity challenges that will only appear in a certain district. I'm just spitballing here, but the point I'm making is that there would have been ways to make these districts feel unique, but that never happens. And as a result, once you've seen one part of Baghdad, you've kind of seen it all. There's also a really big desert surrounding Baghdad, and while there's some things to do out there, there's not much. I know the flat landscape doesn't gel with this more classic Assassin's Creed style formula, but still, that's a lot of space out there, and I think Ubisoft could have used it better to provide some new gameplay experiences separate from what you're always experiencing in the city. So what are you experiencing in the city? Well, it's your standard Ubisoft Assassin's Creed stuff for the most part. There's plenty of chests and hidden compounds. There's pages floating around which you need to chase across rooftops. There's gotta catch them all style treasure hunts, that sort of thing. I didn't engage with a lot of that stuff because it doesn't really interest me, but it's there if you like ticking those boxes. More interesting is the way the city itself responds to you and what you can do about all that. So for example, you can pickpocket people here. It's actually super fun and very satisfying. You walk up behind someone who's got a coin purse dangling off their back. You press the Y button, time slows down, and you have to press it again at the right moment. Get it right and you make a clean getaway, but if you get it wrong, the person you're robbing will publicly call you out, calling over the guards and increasing your notoriety level. So the notoriety level is probably my favorite part of this entire game. It makes a return from previous Assassin's Creed games and Mirage made me realize just how much I missed it. You increase it by committing crimes or by being seen by guards in restricted areas. It has four levels and each new level makes the populace more hostile towards you. At the lowest level, most people won't recognize you as you walk the streets, but the odd person might and they'll try to call the guards over. 
At level four, you are an arch criminal and basically everyone knows your face. People will flee before you as you walk the streets and guards will pounce on you just as soon as look at you. It always makes walking the streets genuinely dangerous. And when this notoriety level is high, you absolutely need to stick to the shadows and the rooftops. So how do you clear this notoriety rating? Well, scattered throughout town are wanted posters with your face on it. Each one you pull down removes one wanted level. So there's this cool loop of trying to steal something from a restricted area, getting spotted by the guards, running through the streets trying to hide while also trying to find wanted posters to take the heat off you. It works really well and it makes the city seem so much more dangerous when you aren't being successful with your stealth or your pickpocketing. And I think this system is the perfect example of how well many of the older Assassin's Creed formula elements have held up. So Baghdad is unlikely to be one of the franchise's most memorable locations, and it definitely struggles when it comes to creating distinctive feeling regions or innovative new activities. But what's there is enough. It really is. It's nice to look at. It feels nice to walk the streets. There's the collectathon stuff there if you want it, and the notoriety system makes the whole place feel more alive and responsive, upping the stakes for failing to maintain the subterfuge that is your order's calling card. But yeah, as cool as all that is, it's somewhat telling that the most impressive aspect of Baghdad is a feature brought back from previous games. It would have been nice to see more innovation in the way this city was designed or the things you could do within it. But unfortunately, Baghdad is rather similar to the game's combat and stealth in that it's solid. But yeah, once you've seen one part of it, you have seen it all. Assassin's Creed Mirage brings back the focus on parkour, stealth, and assassinations. And I gotta tell you, that shit holds up. It really does. And I wanna make that point emphatically because I don't want that gameplay loop to be a casualty of whatever mixed reception Mirage might receive. Mirage has plenty of problems, but the core gameplay elements that underpin it really do work. It's just that Ubisoft don't do anything new or interesting with these things, and they make no effort to augment these gameplay elements over your 15 hour journey. So on the topic of parkour, it's back, and it's really your primary means of getting around Baghdad. In the recent AC trilogy, the spaces were so massive that you'd spend more time on horseback than you would your own two feet, and parkour was really only useful when it was time to infiltrate a fort or whatever. Here, Baghdad is too narrow and crowded for a mount to be useful, so you're going to be on foot almost all of the time, and rooftops are often your most direct route to wherever you're going. I think it must also be said that this is the best feeling Assassin's Creed game I've played. Never has a character in this franchise controlled this smoothly. There's just something about the way Basim takes off when you move him, he slides between crowds, he glides overhead. I think you'll notice it as soon as you pick up the controller. I don't exactly know what Ubisoft did here, but they definitely touched up the controls and animations, and as a result, Basim him handles like a dream. When it's time to do the whole stealth thing, it's exactly what it's always been. Even the recent trilogy offered plenty of stealth options if you wanted to use them. Line of sight, hiding in shrubs, whistling to call guards over, various throwable items that do this or that. The difference here in Mirage is that stealth actually matters because one, you want to keep that notoriety level low and two, you can't just kill everything and everyone with ease because the full frontal combat system is not set up to do that. I'm going to be really interested to see how people respond to combat in Mirage because it's very simple. It's just one button, no combos, no special attacks and just a basic parry. I'm pretty sure plenty of people will be like, this sucks, but it's meant to suck. It's meant to be fairly clunky and ineffective against large groups because combat is more often than not a failure state. You're only meant to be fighting if you fucked up on your stealth. And so it's meant to be disempowering. It's meant to put you on your heels. You're not meant to stand your ground and fight. You're actually meant to dash away, skulk back to the shadows, wait for the guards to reset, and then make another stealthy approach. That loop really works for me because that's how it used to be in the old AC games. But I do wonder how modern audiences will respond to this throwback design. The biggest problem is that as effective and enduring as this core loop is, Ubisoft doesn't take it anywhere. And as such, you can just learn the basic stealth formula and then you can apply that exact same formula in the exact same way for 15 hours and then credits roll. I mean, there aren't even new enemy types introduced at regular intervals who might be able to foil the stealth strategies you've come to rely on. There aren't new environmental elements that make it harder to stealth or give you new opportunities to be stealthy. The encounter design also doesn't create new scenarios that ask you to use your tools in more interesting or innovative ways. It's just the same thing over and over again from beginning to end, really. And the progression system is the perfect example of this. You get perk points to unlock new perks. What do you get? Well, you get things that make it even easier to do the things you were already doing before and that make the core gameplay loop less interesting or challenging. So for example, there's a whole bunch of perks devoted to carrying more throwable ammo. Okay, cool, I guess. Now I can carry more knives. 
There's plenty of upgrades for your bird, which makes it even easier for them to spot things, which makes it easier to avoid guards. And the highest level upgrade available to you in that tree is straight up X-ray vision when you crouch. That just totally breaks so much of what makes the stealth loop tricky or interesting. Yeah, the player is more powerful, but this is just god mode wall hacks, and that only serves to make the already simple and repetitive stealth loop even simpler and more repetitive. The one notable innovation in all of this is the inclusion of various NPCs who can be recruited to help create distractions in key missions. You might help a group of mercenaries break through a gate and they'll distract the guards, or help a local merchant recover their stock so they'll again, you know, move their caravan fort, etc. It's nice, but there's only a handful of times when you can make use of these sorts of mechanics, and even then, they're quite separate from the core gameplay loop that I'm talking about. With no evolution in terms of core gameplay systems, scenario, or level design, the game essentially just gives you bigger and bigger forts to infiltrate and more and more guards to contend with. And that's a big problem. Like a good puzzle game will implement a mechanic and then it will remix that mechanic in interesting ways in subsequent puzzles, so you're still using the same tools but you're using them in new ways. A good Metroidvania will introduce new abilities, giving you whole new mechanics to contend with, allowing you to solve old problems in new ways. Mirage does neither of these things. It doesn't ask anything new of you, nor does it give you anything new other than a, I don't know, sleeping dart, which is basically the same as a throwing knife but non-lethal, or a sound grenade, which is basically the same as whistling, except you can choose where the sound occurs. The core loop here in Mirage is good. The parkour is good. Stealthing and assassinating people is good. But if Ubisoft was gonna give this format a true second lease on life, they needed to bring some new ideas to the table to show how this formula could thrive in the modern era, and they absolutely did not do that here. So I'm sure there's some people from Ubisoft watching this review and they're like, you said you wanted old school Assassin's Creed, so it gave you old school Assassin's Creed and you're still complaining, what the fuck? I'm also sure that that's gonna be a central part of the discourse around this game as well. People will be like, well, this just proves the old formula is played out. But I don't agree. I actually feel kind of the opposite because the parts of this game that I really enjoyed were those core elements. I liked being in one location since it allowed me to really sink into it, learn about it. It created a focus and cohesion that the recent trilogy lacked as you were quickly shuttled from one location to the next. I love the return to the notoriety system and I think it did a great job of making Baghdad feel reactive while incentivizing stealth both on the streets and during main missions. I like the parkour, stealthing and assassinations. I think Basim controls beautifully while he's doing all of this and I just find it more rewarding to silently assassinate an entire regiment of guards than it is to stand in a doorway chipping away at the health of some level gated meat sack enemy with janky ability driven combat. So my problems with Mirage were not about those core throwback elements but rather how little work has gone into advancing them or at least using them in new interesting ways. Baghdad needed more interesting locations and activities. The game desperately needed like eight more enemy types who will force you to adapt to their capabilities in both stealth and full frontal assault. Missions needed more interesting scenarios and the progression pathways needed to make the game more interesting to play rather than just easier to play. But the real kicker is the writing and the structure. Like I said at the top, if this had a fantastic script underpinning it, this review would have a different title. And it's not like that's beyond the reach of this franchise, mind you. I've never loved Assassin's Creed writing, but Bayek is celebrated as one of the best heroes in the franchise's history for how well he was written. And I actually liked the narrative of Odyssey a lot. I'd even go as far as to say it was pretty great. Mirage though, it's just awful. And with a world and gameplay this limited, you needed that writing to really pop off to carry it over the line. It didn't, and so as much as it pains me to say it, I do not recommend Assassin's Creed Mirage. Okay, so for the past few weeks, I've been testing out the all new SteelSeries alias microphone. SteelSeries sent me a pre-release version. I wasn't sure what to expect because microphones are a bit of an art form, but I plugged it in, configured it, and was immediately blown away by not only the sound quality, but the ease of use and how much you can customize everything using SteelSeries' powerful Sonar software suite. So this is the alias. It comes with a weighted stand, but it's also got an adapter for easy mounting on a boom arm. It's got a custom built one inch condenser capsule that's three times the size of standard microphone capsules to flawlessly capture your voice, while a finely tuned cardioid capsule pattern minimizes background noise with a bubble-like capture area. This is the same sort of sound pattern used in broadcast and recording studios and is the optimal solution for accurate and impactful vocals. The alias comes in two variants. There's the alias, which feeds your PC sound via USB, as well as the 
Alias Pro, which connects via XLR, and it has a dedicated audio controller that not only acts as a preamp providing 48 volt phantom power, but it also supports dual PC setups. This is the first product of its type to do that sort of thing, allowing you to feed audio to two PCs at once if you are running a dual PC streaming setup. Whichever version of the mic you get, you're going to be getting access to Sonar, SteelSeries' very powerful software suite that allows you to customize this mic even further. For example, Sonar supports audio routing channels, meaning you can send your voice audio to one channel, your game audio to another, your music to another, and your system sound somewhere else again. This allows you to independently control the volume of each, and you can determine which channels get streamed or recorded. I use this feature all the time when I'm recording gameplay because I don't want Discord chatter to get picked up when I'm recording game sounds. Sonar also supports advanced audio features like a compressor, a noise gate, and AI noise cancelling, which means that background noise is filtered out and only your voice is captured. Sure, that means things like keyboard clicks or background chatter, but it could also mean other things. We're here at the Chicago Air and Water Show testing out sonar with an AI noise cancellation feature. We're just testing it off and on. So if it could cancel out this noise, I imagine we'll be able to cancel out, uh, you know, an air conditioner or a fan in your background or someone talking in your background. Like if it can do this, imagine what it can do for you. Taking a step back, what a package like the Alias Pro gives you is a studio quality mic with a stand and a shock absorber, a powered preamp, and a very flexible and powerful software suite that will allow you to customize both your setup and your sound quality. I really encourage you to go and look for how much it would cost you to get all of those things separately. And what you will find is that the Alias Pro is extremely competitively priced, especially for the quality you're getting. But I've got good news for you. You can get it even more competitively priced thanks to SteelSeries hooking up the channel with a discount. If you go to SteelSeries.com and use offer code SKILLUP at checkout, you'll get a full 12% off your purchase, no strings attached. That works for any product on the SteelSeries store, by the way, from headphones to keyboards to mice and more. Do get in quick if you want to grab an alias, though. They literally just launched last night. They will absolutely sell out. So if you want to grab one before they do, head over to SteelSeries.com and use offer code SKILLUP for 12% off your purchase. Thanks, SteelSeries, for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.